I'll be returning to 1 Peter chapter 2 in a moment after we go to the Lord in prayer before we begin. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you again that we're here tonight. We do want to lift up the prayer request tonight. Pray for James that he would continue to recover from the eye surgery and that he would regain his appetite and his strength and for Norma's biopsy and the removal of what the growth on her arm or back shoulder there. I want to pray for Adam and the pain he's having in the back and the surgery so near the spine. That's always a problem. Pray for our brother Earl that he would regain his strength and be able to get about and do the things that he wants to do. And for all those on our prayer list, Father, we ask that you would work in a mighty way there. And just comfort, aid where necessary, encourage, strengthen, and heal if it be your will. Tonight, Father, as always, I ask your Holy Spirit to enlighten the Word for us. We need His guidance. We need that enlightenment to see the truths that are there. And I thank you that you always answer that prayer. So as we move through the message tonight, Father, please give us open and receptive hearts to your Word. And again, what we learn tonight that we take with us and use in our life, that we may grow closer to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and become better, stronger witnesses for you. And I do ask this in the name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We weren't here last week, and so we're picking up in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 6, and just a few verses tonight. Beginning in verse 6, Peter writes, Wherefore also it is contained in the Scriptures, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you therefore which believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, or unto also they were appointed. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him that also hath, who hath called you out of darkness into the marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Paul begins this portion of Scripture by quoting Scripture. He quotes Isaiah 28, 16. Therefore saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion the foundation of stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation, that he believeth shall not make haste. I hope you understand we're talking about the stone here. We're talking about Jesus Christ. You have to, when you put everything together, there's no doubt about it. It's not just my opinion. It's a fact that's very clear in Scripture. The reason that people don't really understand everything in Scripture, they don't study Scripture. They don't take time. They read it casually. But Paul continues, Unto you, therefore, which believe, he is precious. That's pretty powerful, isn't it? He is precious. What we might say today a little differently, you therefore which believe is the preciousness because you believe it's precious to know Jesus Christ. Once again, I want to point out that that old fisherman, Simon Peter, that big rugged fisherman, uses the word precious. I guess I'm old fashioned. Well, I don't guess. I know I'm old fashioned. There's no doubt about it. And to me, I hear precious and my mind says, that is a word that a woman uses. Okay, don't, don't tell me I'm a male show this. That's just the way I am, old fashioned. Precious is one of those words that real men just don't use. You know, I don't go to the ball game and say, well, isn't that basic precious? You know, that would, they'd throw you out of the ballpark. It's just not something that a man uses. But I want you to note something very important. Whenever Peter speaks of Christ or his blood or anything about him, he uses the word precious. And I think any man could use it in that context. 
But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, rejected, the same is made the head of the corner. And he goes on to say, And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. That's a very important passage of Scripture. It's a quotation from Psalm 118.22. But we'll talk about for a moment about the tradition that dates back to the building of the first temple, Solomon's temple. A lot of times we have to look at different things so that the meaning of Scripture really comes alive to us. In 1 Kings 6-7, it talks about the actual construction of the temple. It says, And the house, when it was in building, was built of stone, made ready before it was brought thither, so that there was neither hammer, hammer nor axe, nor any tool of iron heard in the house while it was in building. What that means is the stones were hewn in the quarry to the exact measurement, perfect, and then they were shipped to the site of construction up on the Temple Mound. When they reached the, the site there, the temple construction, there was no sound of a hammer, nothing. The stones were fitted into place perfectly. Now tradition says that at the beginning of the building of the temple, a very large and fine looking stone was brought up to the construction area. But the problem for the builders, they couldn't find any spot that it fit. And they were you know, kind of perplexed about this. So they simply took that stone and they moved it off to the side. Then because it was such a large stone and it was in the way over the period of time of construction, it got, they pushed that stone over the hill to make room for all the other stones that they received from the quarry. Over a period of time, they forgot about that stone at the bottom of the hill. When all the other stones had been received, they had been put into place in the temple, they sent a message to the quarry, send up the cornerstone. The quarry said, we sent that stone first. Then the builders had already received it. And that's at the time when they realized, wait a minute, we rejected that stone because it didn't fit. We pushed it over the hill. So with a great deal of effort, they had to haul that stone back up to the hill there to the construction site, and it fit perfectly as the cornerstone. If this tradition is accurate, it explains the verses before us perfectly, doesn't it? That stone which the builders rejected had become the head of the corner. If this tradition is true, then the people who read this, the people who heard this, they would have said, that makes perfect sense. We know that that stone was rejected. And didn't the nation reject Jesus Christ? The stone in this picture, of course, is Jesus Christ. When he came into the world, he was rejected by his own people. John 1, 11 tells us he came into his own and his own received him not. He was the stone that was rejected. Not only then was Jesus rejected, but now 2,000 years later, we live in a world that is continually a Christ-rejecting world. They're still taking that stone and moving it out of the way, rolling it down the hill. Just think about Christmas time, if you will. Hard to think about Christmas, I know, on a day like this, but think about it for a moment. It seems that every little town and village across America, probably around the world almost, they celebrate the Christmas holiday. But the fact is, Christ is rejected. Think about it for a moment. You go to a store, do you see anything about the manger? Do you see anything about Jesus Christ? You see Santa Claus, you see Christmas trees, you see ornaments, wrapping paper, but they celebrate Christmas without Jesus Christ. How can you celebrate a holiday for somebody's birthday and don't mention the one whose birthday it is? That's hypocritical. They reject the very one they should be celebrating. You see, they're still taking that stone and pushing it over the hill. Now consider this. Our Lord Jesus Christ is to you today either a stepping stone or a stumbling stone. Here again, there's no other choice. 
Isn't it amazing how the Bible just gives you a choice? It's this A or B. There's no C, D, or E. It's A or B. Yes or no. Again, no other choice. So with that said, we come now to a very, very important and wonderful passage of Scripture, which tells us that a Christian's life is equal with their position in Christ. Here's the fact. Until you live that life, you live the life you should in Jesus Christ, you're not experiencing Christian living. He says in, in verse 9, this, but ye, he's talking to believers now. He's talking to you and me. 2,000 years later, he's talking to us. Just as he did in that letter. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You know, Peter, who's writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, it's his own way of doing it, but the Holy Spirit is inspiring him what to say. He tells us very, some very marvelous things about the Christian in these passages. We're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, and a people of his own. Basic, you know, not a peculiar people. Now, we are peculiar to the world. The world out there says, how in the world can you believe that a man came back from the dead? How can you believe that somebody could walk on water, calm the sea, raise the dead, heal the sick, make the blind? You're peculiar. See, in their idea, you're strange. And we are peculiar to the world. But actually, it means... We are peculiar because we are a people of his own. I know the world looks at us as peculiar. I know that. But God's people are not supposed to be oddballs. We're not crackpots. And we're not ready for the funny farm. We're not like that. So that's the way people think of peculiar. That's what they, oh, he's peculiar. He needs to be locked up somewhere. Which is what the world would like to do to us. They'd like to hush us up. It's more meaningful for us to, I think, look at peculiar people as a people of his own. And that is peculiar to the world. I want to look at several things here because these are important for Christians. We are a chosen generation. That is, we're an elect race. Back in the Old Testament, God chose Israel as his people. And in the scriptures, we find there are two elect peoples. Just two. First was the nation of Israel, a, a, a nation that was called elect, and the church, an elect nation, an elect people. Keep in mind that Peter, at this point, this letter is written to his own people. Those were in dispersion all over the world. These are Jewish Christians. And they were scattered all over the Roman Empire and even beyond its boundaries. They have been scattered all over. And Peter's saying, although right now you probably certainly don't look like you're a set-aside elect people, you may not feel like a chosen generation, an elect race, but you are. Don't let the, the world determine what you are. Don't let the world say, oh, you're nothing special. You are. You're special because you belong to the Lord. The reason you're special is you've come to Jesus Christ and therefore you are a chosen generation. You are part of an elect nation. Just as the children of Israel were elect. You know, there's something about this we need to remember. The keys of the kingdom have been given to the church. Did you realize that? We today are not to hide the keys but rather we are to give the gospel out because the gospel is the instrument that brings people to Jesus Christ and for salvation. That's the key to the kingdom. That's the key to heaven. You know, we can't put that key in our pocket. We need to use it. The giving out of the gospel is the giving out of the keys of heaven. And that's, that's our job. You know, we're, we're to be witnesses to the whole world. Telling others of Jesus Christ allows them to see the truth and to follow the, whole, the calling of the Holy Spirit to salvation. That is the great honor 
that's been given to every single believer. You've been given a charge. Whether you realize it or not, you have a job that you have to do. It's just as if God had stamped out a wonderful medal for every believer and it says, you are an elect race, you're a chosen generation. Yeah. You can wear it right here, just like you would a military decorate. That's what it is. You have been chosen for something. Let me tell you, I get pretty weary of people who make those vain attempts to identify certain people of this earth as the ten lost tribes of Israel. Have you ever heard all those theories? First thing I want to tell you about the, the theory of the lost tribes, they've never been lost. They were not lost when the northern kingdom went into captivity with Syria. They weren't lost. They weren't lost when Jesus walked the earth and they're not lost today. God knows where every single member of Israel is. They're not lost. But people continue to insist that the lost tribes of Israel are, for example, the Gypsies, the Mormons, the Adventists, the British Israel group, which is probably the most vocal of that group. Now here's the question about this. Even if those people could prove that England and America were settled by the ten lost tribes of Israel, what have they really proven? Think about it. What have you proved? Not one thing. Think about it. They proved nothing. God set, has set aside, put blinders on Israel temporarily. But I want to tell you something about the blinders. Do you know percentage-wise, just as many of the children of Israel come to salvation as Gentiles? The number's not as great because they're not, the numbers of Israel are not as great as the Gentile world. But they're still being saved. And we know that the time will come when all of Israel shall be saved. When the Lord comes back, they look upon Him whom they pierced. God set aside that nation temporarily because He's doing something with a new thing. God has His plans and His purposes for Israel, and they're eternal. If you look at the Abrahamic covenant, land, seed, blessing, they're going to get the land when we get into the kingdom. God has not forgotten Israel, and He never will. I'm going to tell you something. If you're listening to somebody that says that God's forgotten Israel, get away, because that's a false teaching. If God is through with Israel, how do we know the promises of the church are true? God's Word is true. And if you belong to any group that is anti-Semitic, boy, you better straighten them out and get out of there. Because remember, I will bless thee and curse thee. I will bless thee and bless thee and curse them and curse thee. That hasn't changed. Now for the last 2,000 years, God has been and continues to call out an elect race, a chosen generation from every tongue, every nation, every people on this earth, both Jew and Gentile. And they are brought into a new relationship in God. It's called the church. Ecclesia, the called together ones, the called out ones. Although you and I say we have come to Christ, He says, He's chosen you. I'm not talking about Calvinism here in any way. Don't misunderstand me. But I like that. He has chosen us. It kind of reminds me of the story that I heard about the two poor children who came from the slums of New York and Christmas time and they went to Macy's and they were looking in the window and they're looking at things that they can never have. Right? They say, one says, I want that. And the other one says, that little boy says, I want the ball. The little girl says, I want the doll. See, we are exactly like those two poverty-stricken children. We're looking in the window too. We look to Jesus and say, I choose Jesus. I want Him. And then we find out that He's already chosen us. How wonderful is that? You see, the Lord said of His apostles, I have, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. It's wonderful to know that our Lord has chosen us, and yet we have to choose Him. You know, we don't surprise the Lord. Anytime somebody comes to Jesus Christ for salvation, you didn't surprise Him. He knew eternity ago the exact moment you were going to come to salvation. I want to tell you something else. Anyone who comes to Jesus Christ is elect. You're elect because you're saved. It's that simple. I'm not being irreverent. I don't mean to be irreverent here when I say that since Jesus Christ has chosen me, 
He's responsible for me. The responsibility is his because I belong to him. How wonderful is that, that he has chosen us and we chose him. And he accepted us. Why should he ever accept us? You ever thought about that? We are pretty bad. You look at our back. We're pretty bad. I know this morning I said, don't look back. You know, don't, don't think. But think back for a moment what you were when Jesus said, yes, I've been waiting on you to come home. By the way, no matter who comes, no matter how bad they are, no matter what their situation, when they come to Jesus in faith, He accepts them. He doesn't turn anybody away. Most powerful word, one of the most powerful words of Scripture is whosoever. When Jesus was on the cross, you were on His mind. Secondly, we are a royal priesthood. Now, don't get a swelled head over that though. Back in the Old Testament, God first of all chose the entire nation of Israel to be priests. But they sinned. And so He took one tribe, Levi, out of that nation made them priests. One tribe. Today, there is no priesthood on earth that God recognizes except one. And I'm not talking about the priesthood of Rome. You know, if you look at the what the church is, who leads the church, we're all believer priests, but there are pastors and there are deacons and there are elders, but there are no priests. And you know something else? It doesn't tell you that you need to put on a collar and some black suit. It just You just come before the Lord in the best you can wear because you, you're not standing above anybody. We're all in the same boat. You know, today, every believer in the Lord Jesus Christ is a priest. Israel had a priesthood to, in the old times, in the Old Testament. Today, the church is the priesthood. The church. Now, you're the church. If you're a believer, I'm the church. It's an individual thing. Together, we're the body of Christ. The church universal. But it's, when we say the church is the priest, we're the priests. And since we belong to Christ, we come into His presence we come right into the very of the very holy of holies. Now, who could go into the holy of holies in the Old Testament times? The high priest. Only. He had to be the high priest. The regular priest couldn't do it. But you know what? We can. Every believer can. Hebrews 4:16. Let us there come, therefore come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. The throne of grace. Where's the throne of grace? That's God's throne. In the Old Testament, the Holy of Holies, that was God's throne. We can come right to Him. That's a priest. We're also told that as believers, we're members of a royal priesthood. Let me say hallelujah. Because as a born-again believer, we are children of the King. Not only are we believer priests, we're royalty. You ever think about it? People make some... I think wouldn't the king, whatever, this whatever his name, oh Charles, what he this week throne, crown, king, whatever. We are children of the king. He can have all that he wants. I'd rather wait and be part of my family. You know, a little later in this letter, we're going to read that the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and He hears the righteous man's prayers. Tell me that's not wonderful. Being part of the royal priesthood. And we are a holy nation. Now we're not talking about any earthly nation here. We're talking about the church. The nation of Israel was never holy in conduct. And before you get a big head again, the same thing can be said of the church. We have never been totally holy in our conduct. Israel's failures to read them in Scripture, they're glaring. The church's failures is appalling. And we have failed. And we continue to fail. Yet we are holy in our relationship to Him because Jesus Christ is our righteousness. And praise the Lord for that. On our own, we have no righteousness. On our own, we're just... Yeah, we're terrible. 
but we are in the righteousness of Christ. And I can't take, tell you anything more wonderful than that, that we as believers stand complete in Jesus Christ. What a joy it is to be a member of the holy nation. Holy means, you go, hey, yes, set aside. We are a set aside nation. That's a new nation in the world today. And you know what? We're not uh, members of the United Nations. We're not, we don't have an army that's ready to go to war in the way people think. But we do have an army that needs to go to war giving out the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we are a peculiar people. Yes, we are. A people of His own. We're a people of acquisition. A people of God's own possession. We belong to God. You know, this earth is not even our home. I know we, we say, well, this is my house. This is my yard. This isn't our home. We're sojourners. We are just passing through. Where are we passing through? We're heading home. You know, when I do a funeral, that's what I like to remind everybody. If he's a believer, you're not, selling, you're not talking about he's going to be in heaven. It's a home going. He's already there. He has gone home. That's where we're all heading. There is in the world today, not only, we're not only a new nation, but we're also a people that belong to Him. And I don't know why some Christians are afraid to grasp hold of that concept. It doesn't mean that we're peculiar in conduct and, and we act strangely. It means that we belong to Him. We belong to God. That's a close relationship, isn't it? When you belong to God. Once you get that in your mind, you hold on to it. You realize this world is peculiar. And I mean strange and wicked because we belong to the king. We can compare it to a, kind of like a boy who goes out and gets a job. He makes his own money for the first time. His dad had been giving an allowance up to then and now the money belongs to him. It's something he worked for. It's something of his very own. Well, Christ's work, his work of redemption required shedding his blood as we've seen in this letter. And, and now he has a people of his very own. You thought, well, salvation's free. It's free for us. Jesus paid a great price that we could be saved. You know, in his high priestly prayer, the Lord Jesus said, I have man manifest thy name unto men, which thou givest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou givest them me. See, like the little, little fellow who went out and got a job for his own, now it's his. They were your, you give, give them to me, Father. He said, all the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. And you know what that is, folks? That is eternal security. I like to point out, there's only several thousand eternal security passages in Scripture. Don't let anybody tell you that you don't have eternal security. You come to Jesus for with salvation, you believe, He's not going to ever cast you out. 10,000 years from now, you're still going to be with Him. It's wonderful that the Father has given you and given me to Jesus Christ. And God calls His own. He calls you today. He calls people all over the world. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what nation you come from, what race you are. He calls. You need to come. Jesus is calling you to be His own. He wants you to join that chosen generation that royal priesthood he's inviting you to wear the robes or not put on those robes of the old testament priest or to recite rituals but to join the priesthood that actually has access to god he's asking you to become part of a new nation he doesn't ask you to give up your citizenship of America. 
He's asking you to accept your citizenship in heaven. You know, Paul says he sees us in the heavenlies right now. That's eternal security. If God sees me in the heavenlies with him right now, someday he's going to see me actually there. That's eternal security. And that new nation is not Germany, England, Japan, not the United States. It's the church. God asks you to belong to a great company of believers out of every nation. Psalm 144.15 says, Happy is that people whose God is the Lord. Happy is that. That's what we should be happy. Psalm 79.13 So we are thy people and the sheep of thy pasture. His people. Through the prophet, prophet Isaiah, God says over in Isaiah 53.8, For the transgressions of my people was he stricken. Jesus, that's the best of the Messiah. For our sins, he was stricken. Now he says, for my people. New Testament says, wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Hebrews 13, 12. People. We are the people. His people. Sanctify the people. Set aside those people. That's a wonderful position that we have as believers in Jesus Christ. Verse 10 says this, which in time past were not a people, Ooh. but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy which in time past were not a people. Wow, there's a time there was no church. We didn't belong. Man, we didn't belong. You know, in the Old Testament, the church is not mentioned. Don't ever let anybody tell you that when you see Israel in the Old Testament, you slip the word church in there. Israel is Israel. The church is the church. They're completely two different peoples. You see... In time past, we were not a people. That tells us how very close to we were we were all to spending an eternity in hell. Because we didn't belong to God. In fact, we were as far from God as east is from the west. In those pre-salvation days, we had not obtained mercy, but and boy, this is such a wonderful word in Scripture. That little three letter three letter, but now have obtained mercy. You know, those little words in Scripture are so important. But you hadn't obtained any mercy, but by the grace of God you have now. Over the years, we've all received gifts and some of them we didn't like, some of them we really didn't want. Those gifts were discarded or maybe re-gifted. There's one gift that no one will want to miss out on and the name on that box is Mercy. Think back when you were a child. Maybe it was a birthday or Christmas. The biggest box got your attention, didn't it? On Christmas, all those boxes out there, you went to the big box. You wondered what was in that big box. That was the gift you opened first. Let me tell you, the biggest box you're ever going to receive is the gift of mercy because God is rich in mercy. His mercy is boundless. And if you're in need of mercy today, you can go to Him for it. You know, He doesn't wrap that box so that you can't get it open. It opens easily. Again, remember that Peter is writing to those believing Jews who have been dispersed all over the empire. He said, which in time past you were not a people. That is, they had rejected Jesus Christ as their Messiah and God had rejected them. But now, but are now the people of God. There's, but now, there's that but again. But now are the people of God. God was, and He continues to do a, an amazing thing in calling out a people, and He extends mercy to them. You know, there's things that we, you know, God never runs out of grace, unmerited favor. He never runs out of mercy. And He makes it available to everyone. But isn't it wonderful that we as believers are part of a royal priesthood? I'm happy to be part of a, a peculiar people and a believer priest. 
Because we have opened as believers, we've opened that tremendous box of mercy. And if this box was as big as our sanctuary, you'd never run out, would you? Or if that box were no bigger than my recorder here, you'd still never be empty. Kind of be like Elijah and the widow woman, wouldn't it? You're never going to run out. God doesn't run out of mercy or grace. He wants you to be part of His family, that royal priesthood. Let us pray. Father, what a wonderful portion of Scripture. And we are so glad that we accepted that stone that the builders rejected in Jesus Christ. And because of that, Father, we know that we are part of that royal priesthood and that we are a peculiar people people of your possession. Thank you for your mercy, your grace, your love. It's hard for us really to comprehend your love, Father. While we were yet sinners, low down and lost, Jesus came for us and died for us. Father, the simple invitation tonight is to come and become part of a peculiar people become part of a people that are your possession. Father, help us to go out into the world. Our calling is to take the keys to heaven and give them out to the world. And that key is Jesus Christ. Father, allow us to be bold in our witness, strong in our lifestyle, and display our love for you at every possible moment. Thank you, Father, for those who have turned aside tonight to be with us. I pray that your word has blessed them, encouraged them. And as we leave tonight, Father, allow us to be the best witnesses we can be, not only in word, but how we live our life day in and day out. Put that protective hedge about us that we may have safety as we go and that we may return again at the next appointed time. And I thank you again for all the blessings you bestowed. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.